glad you could all make it out this morning with this less than pleasant weather. It's certainly good to be together once again. Um, if you were here last week, then we began a, a series dealing with some of the, the big doctrines of the Bible. And I emphasized last week that sometimes people think of doctrine as, as dusty and dry and maybe something for theologians but not for ordinary people. But these doctrines that we're going to be speaking about have very real life applications. And they are important truths for us to to at least try to begin to grasp. And some of them admittedly are very, very complex, very difficult. They mentioned the, uh, the words of the Lord Jesus where he said that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind. And we're encouraged to think. We're encouraged to to use the brains that God has given us, to wrestle with the things that he has laid down for us in his word. And, and indeed, some of them are very complex and great minds, far greater than mine, have wrestled with them over the centuries and um, are still wrestling with them. And I know I like things neat and tidy, black and white. I'm an accountant, things have to be orderly. And ambiguity is hard and, and yet, God in his wisdom has made some things ambiguous and, and not as neat and tidy as we would like. But that's the God that we have and we, we wrestle with that and we, we accept him for who he is. And so this morning we want to think about the doctrine of the Trinity. I should have been better prepared and had this on an overhead, but this is an ancient symbol that was used to speak of the Trinity. And you'll see this on ancient crosses and tombstones and so on. And obviously you've got the three parts all equal. And that's, that's the essence of the Trinity. That we have one God yet manifest in three persons. Three and yet one. And how do we wrap our minds around that? How can God be three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet be one God? Is that not three gods? Well, no, it's one God. Someone has said that if you try to explain it, you will lose your mind. But if you try to deny it, you will lose your soul. And so this morning, we're going to try and at least grasp or wrestle a bit with what does the Trinity mean? And, and especially as we look at the scriptures, do we see this in the Trinity? Is this, something that, is this something that's made up, this idea of the Trinity? Or is this really in the scriptures? So we're going to, we're going to think about what does it really mean? But then the bigger question is, well, so what? God is a Trinity. So what? What difference does it make? How does that impact my life in Heidelberg in 2022? And so we're going to think about a few practical applications of the fact that God is a trinity. I'd like to begin by reading a portion in John's Gospel, chapter 17. And I'm not going to in any way expound this chapter, but in this chapter, we have the prayer of the Lord Jesus just prior to going to the cross. And we see in this prayer the relationship between the Father and the Son. And I'm just going to read a portion, not all of the chapter. John chapter 17, verse 1, I'm reading from the New English Translation. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he looked upward to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. 
just as you have given him authority over all humanity so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him? Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I had with you before the world was created. Now, down to verse 20. I am not praying only on their behalf, that is, the disciples, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony, that they will all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. The glory you gave to me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world will know that you sent me and you have loved them just as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so they can see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, even if the world does not know you, I know you. And these men know that you sent me and I made known your name to them. And I will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. And now just over to Matthew 28 to a, a very well-known portion. Matthew 28, the last couple of verses. Verse 18. Then Jesus came up and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And there, in this verse, we see one of the clearest uh, statements in the New Testament of the three persons of the Godhead linked together in equality. The name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And now, it's interesting that one of the things here that isn't necessarily obvious from the text, but that the word name there is in the singular it's one name. It's not the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's the name, singular. It's one name, one God, and yet the three persons laid out for us there. So as we think about this question of, of the Trinity, we have three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't think that there would be many that would question that the Father is God. Um, the Lord Jesus uses the term Heavenly Father more times in his gospel by far than any other writer. And, and he uses it in a way that is really kind of interchangeable for, for God. And so, so the Father is God, is fully God. But then the Lord Jesus is also fully God. And last week we thought in detail about the Lord Jesus, both his, his deity as well as his humanity. And I mentioned a number of ways that we see his deity. We, we talked about his power over the forces of nature, calming the storm on the sea. Um, how he could heal sickness, he could cast out demons. He even showed his power over death by raising the dead. He forgave sins. 
he received worship. All of these things are marks of his, of his deity. One thing that I didn't mention last week, but that is, is very significant, in Matthew chapter 26, when the Lord Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest basically says, I charge you under oath, tell us, are you the son of God? And what did Jesus say? It is as you say. Yes. He did not deny that he was the son of God. He didn't say, no, 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 it's some kind of mistake. I was never claiming to be God. He said, no, it's as you say. And he went on to quote from Daniel chapter 7, a portion that very clearly linked him to the Messiah, where he says that you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, that's exactly what Daniel 7 says. And the Son of Man was a term that the Jewish Sanhedrin understood to refer to the Messiah and to a divine Messiah. And Jesus said, that's, that's me. And, and the response of the high priest was he tore his clothes and he said, blasphemy. He understood clearly that Jesus was claiming to be God. Um, many times, um, different false cults and religions will say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He absolutely did. And this scene before the Sanhedrin is one of the clearest. And so the Lord Jesus is fully God. But then we have the Holy Spirit as well. I, I don't know, perhaps sometimes there's a tendency to think about the Holy Spirit perhaps as, as a force, as a power, as an influence. But the Holy Spirit is actually a divine person. Um, we read about being able to grieve the Holy Spirit. You don't grieve a force. You, it talks in um, Acts 5.32 that, that we are witnesses of these things, talking about the resurrection, and he says, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a witness. In Romans 8, it talks about the Spirit interceding for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit prays. And in 1 Corinthians uh, 3.16, Paul writes, don't you know that you are God's temple? Speaking to the Christians. Well, why is that? Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And so the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives makes us God's temple because the Holy Spirit is God. And then in John 14, as the Lord Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying, I'm going to be going away, and they're sad, and, and he says, well, understand that unless I go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. And he describes him as another comforter or another advocate to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, he resides with you and he will be in you. And, and the word that he uses there for another, I guess in Greek there are two words for another. One is another of a different kind or another of the same kind. And here it's the word another of the same kind. The Holy Spirit is like me, the Lord Jesus is saying. And he's going to come and be with you and be in you. And, and, well, if you say that the Holy Spirit is less than God, then how can Jesus be saying, well, that he's another of the same kind? It would be kind of like me saying to, my, to our kids when they were younger, okay, we're going to go to Canada's Wonderland. And then a little bit later I change my mind and say, well, we're going to do something just as good. We're going to go to the Splash Park in Waterloo. Well, it's kind of the same, but it's not the same. It's not of the same parallel as Canada's Wonderland, at least in the eyes of kids. It's not another of the same kind. Well, the Lord Jesus saying the Holy Spirit is another of the same kind. 
So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three fully God and yet united together as one God. So as we, as we think of, of the three persons of the Godhead, are there other references in scripture that would teach that in fact this idea of a trinity is right? Well, there are in the New Testament a number of verses that, that would very clearly convey that idea. We, we mentioned Matthew 28 already, the fact that the baptismal formula that is given there links together all three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we could also think about the baptism of the Lord Jesus. And just turn back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John to be baptized him in the Jordan River. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Jesus replied to him, Let it happen now, for it's right for you to fulfill all righteousness. Then John yielded to him. Now notice, after Jesus was baptized, just as he was coming up out of the water, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my one dear Son. In him I take great delight. And so we have all three persons of the Godhead present. We have the Lord Jesus in the water being baptized. We have the Holy Spirit coming in the form of a dove. And we have God the Father in heaven and his voice speaking and pa passing his blessing on, on, the, on his son. So all three persons of the Godhead present. And as we, as we look in the New Testament, we see all three persons of the Godhead at work in different ways. Turn to um, Titus chapter 3. And we'll see how all three persons of the Godhead are involved in our salvation. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but on the basis of his mercy through the washing of the new birth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us in full measure through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so it begins with God our Savior has appeared, but then it's, it ends with through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so both God the Father and Jesus Christ are referred to as our Savior. And in the middle, the, the means is the washing of the new birth by the Holy Spirit. And so we have all three persons of the Godhead engaged in our salvation and accomplishing it. You know, we... we we often think about the Lord Jesus as our Savior. We call him our Savior. We don't think as much about God as our Savior. No, it's not God that died on the cross. Not God the Father. It was God the Son that died on the cross. But God the Father was the one who instituted and, and brought to pass the whole plan of salvation. And so it's not at all wrong to speak of God as our Savior as well. So all three persons involved in our salvation. We see the same in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. We won't take time to look at that. 
Then over in 1 Corinthians, we see all three persons involved in giving gifts to the church, equipping believers for ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4. Now there are different gifts, but the same spirit. And there are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different results, but the same God who produces all of them in every one. To each person, the manifestation of the spirit is, the be- is given for the benefit of all. And so again, here we have all three persons of the Godhead. The the Spirit, the Lord Jesus, and and God the Father. All three of them involved in this process of equipping us for ministry. And and just the way it's worded there, there's no um, difference in equality of the persons of the Godhead. They're all listed in the same fashion. They're all co-equal. And finally, over to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. And again, verse 4. You notice all these are are verse 4s. I'm not sure why that is, but Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you too were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And they suggest that this is actually a very ancient creedal statement that would predate the writing when Paul wrote Ephesians, but was actually one of the earliest formulations that the early church used to describe God and salvation. One God, and yet all three persons are mentioned there. Spirit, Lord, and Father. And we could also look at at 2 Corinthians 13 and 14, where there's a benediction that says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Again, all three persons um, mentioned together, co-equal. So there there should be no doubt in our mind that this is clearly a teaching in the New Testament. It is is seen over and over again. And and as we read the New Testament, it, it seems very clear that it views the members of the Godhead as equal, as equally God in every respect. And certainly John's gospel brings that out so powerfully as the Lord Jesus talks about the Father and the relationship between the Father and the Son. But then that raises the question, what about the Old Testament? What about the Jewish understanding of God from the Old Testament? The Jews very much resisted the idea that Jesus could be God. They said there's one God, not two gods or three gods, one God. And of course, we know the, um, the Ten Commandments begin with that very strong statement. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one God. You will have no other gods before me. And so the emphasis there is on the oneness of God. So how do we reconcile that with the threeness that we see in the New Testament? Is there a contradiction there? Well, it's very interesting as as we dig into the Old Testament that we see various um, intimations of the Trinity. It's not categorically stated. It's not brought out as clearly as in the New Testament. Somebody has said that the Old Testament is like a room that's fairly dark and there's no light in it 
and it's actually a room that's very lavishly furnished and there's fancy things on the wall and nice furniture but you go into the room and it's kind of dark and you can't really see but when you shine the light of the new testament into this room then all of a sudden you see all of the the nice things that are there in this room and as we look back at the old testament with our understanding of God that has been revealed by the Lord Jesus, then we begin to see things in the Old Testament that perhaps the Jewish people at the time never really saw. I'm reading a book right now by a man named David Mitchell, who's a Jewish believer, and the book is simply called Jesus. And he spends quite a bit of time in the Old Testament showing how there are all of these intimations of the Trinity of the Lord Jesus as Messiah being fully God and it's quite fascinating. One of the things that he points out <clears throat> is here in this verse that I just quoted, the Deuteronomy 6, the beginning of the, the Ten Commandments, um, that there is this grammatical construction where you have a, a singular and a plural together. And, you know, we, I, I might say that, that Sharon and I, that we are coming to church this morning. But the way the grammar is used here in the Old Testament, it is that we is coming to church. It's a plural, but yet a singular verb. So the plural, we, referring to the Godhead, giving the idea that that the Godhead is, a, is not just one, but it's a, a union or a, a, a multiplicity of persons. And yet is the singular verb that we, or that it is one, one God. And, and we see that in Isaiah chapter six, verse eight, the, the scene where Isaiah sees the glory of the Lord and the Lord says, who shall I send? singular and who will go for us plural singular and plural both speaking of god and, and there are other examples like that even in the creation account let us make man in our image let us plural make man singular well, why is that? It doesn't make sense grammatically, and yet that construction appears multiple times. Well, it would seem to be a hint that, that God is more than just a single being, that there is a multiplicity to God. Um, we also see examples in the Old Testament where we have the angel of the Lord appearing. Um, perhaps one of the ones most familiar to us is the story of the burning bush. And it says that the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And we know how Moses goes over. And the angel says, take your shoes off, your sandals, because this is holy ground. But then it says that when the Lord saw that, not the angel of the Lord anymore, but when the Lord saw that, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and so on. And so all of a sudden the angel of the Lord is not speaking anymore just as an angel, but he's speaking as God. And we see the same thing in Genesis chapter 22, when God told Abraham to go up on Mount Moriah to offer his son as a sacrifice. And it says the angel of the Lord called to him and said, Abraham, hold, hold off, don't kill your son. The angel of the Lord spoke to him. But then the angel of the Lord says, now I know that you fear God. And, and it's the voice of God speaking. And so we have this angel of the Lord who it seems is almost interchangeable with God. And yet he is this, this separate this separate entity and, and we see that in a number of different cases where it's the angel of the Lord but then all of a sudden it's actually the Lord himself 
Just a couple of more of Old Testament ones. Um, Isaiah 48, um, verse 13 and 16. You, you can look at that perhaps on your own and see again that all three persons of the Trinity are, are there. Our time is going quickly. I promise to finish early today. Um, there's a number of bad illustrations. Okay, we've talked about scripture. We talk about the, the Trinity, but then a lot of us have probably heard illustrations about the Trinity. And, and most of the illustrations are bad illustrations. They don't really do it justice. Perhaps one that you've heard of is that it's like an egg where there is a shell and an egg white and a yolk. All three are together to make one egg, but there's three parts to it. And that's the way the Trinity is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, what's wrong with that picture of the Trinity? Why is that not a good illustration? The reason is that what we're talking about are three parts to an egg. They're not separate things in and of themselves. They, they don't have a separate existence. If they're not part of the egg, they're not really, they're not really anything. Um, what about the idea that the Trinity is like water? It can exist in a solid form, ice. It can exist in a liquid form. Or it can exist in a gas, steam. Is that like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? One God, but in three different forms. Well, that's really an ancient heresy called modalism, which really denies the separate persons of the Godhead. They're just saying that Father, Son, and the Spirit are different modes rather than separate persons. And modalism would talk about how they're successive, not simultaneous. So that doesn't really do the job. What about a three-leaf clover? You've got one clover, but three sort of parts to it. And uh, it's said that St. Patrick used that to teach the Trinity. But really, it's still just one clover. It's not three clovers. It's not three beings. It's one being. It's one thing. I would suggest that perhaps a better illustration, and certainly it's not a perfect illustration, it's, it's, it's maybe better, is, is marriage, where you have a husband and wife two separate individuals, and they're united together in marriage. The scriptures say they become one. And, and I know that many times our kids, you know, they will say, well, I told mom this, thinking that that means that I should know it too. Now, in fact, maybe I don't know it, or they've told me and I haven't told Sharon. But there's the idea that, well, I told one person, so this, this unity of my parents should know this. And, and, and perhaps that's a little bit closer to, to what we have in the Godhead. We've got three separate persons, and yet they're one. They're fully united. They fully know each other, and, and they fully always act together. Well, let's get to some applications. So what? God is a trinity. What, what's the significance of that? Well, first of all, I think it's important that we be careful in our terms as we describe the Godhead and the persons of the Godhead. God has chosen to reveal himself in this way that is who he is. Um, but we need to be careful about how we, we describe and use the terms of the Godhead. Sometimes I, I hear people praying and thanking God for dying for them. Well, it wasn't God the Father that died for them, it was the Lord Jesus. And I understand certainly the heart behind the prayer. And I'm not, I'm not belittling that in any way, but the terms are important. And it is the Lord Jesus that died, not the Father. Sometimes we hear people praying to the Holy Spirit. Well, we don't have any examples in the New Testament that I'm aware of where somebody prays to the Holy Spirit. We pray to the Father through the Son and in the name of the Son, but we don't pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that, that prays for us and takes our prayers and presents them to the Father. Um, 
the imagery of the father is that of a loving, caring benefactor, perhaps. Um, even in the Old Testament, where the term father is almost never used to describe God, in Psalm 103, it says that as a father cares for or pities his children in the King James, so God cares for us. And it is the idea of, of a caring father. Um, one of my pet peeves is how sometimes in our songs, the writers take a certain amount of poetic license with, with the words of the songs. Um, there's one that we sing here sometimes, and it talks about the Father's wrath completely satisfied. And, and again, I understand the sentiment of what the hymn writer is trying to say, but it never talks about the Father's wrath. Wrath is something that, that God, and, in, and even the Lord Jesus, it talks about the wrath of the Lamb in Revelation. It's something that is going to be poured out on an unbelieving world. But it never speaks of the Father's wrath. The word Father is used to describe the love and the care of God for his people. So we need to be careful in our terms. That's the first application. The second application is we need to take time to get to know God. You know, we read in John chapter 17, the Lord's prayer, his desire that, that we would know him, that we would know the love that the Father has for the Son. And, and to be able to enter into that, it, it's not going to happen by just sort of a few minutes here and there in prayer or in reading the Bible. It, it takes time. Um just as it takes time to get to know to a person at a human level. If, um, if a couple are dating and they never spend time together, how, how are they going to get to know one another? How are they really going to begin to understand each other? And various places in the New Testament, there is this idea of coming to get a fuller knowledge of God, an understanding of God, Paul prays in, in Ephesians and Colossians that we, would, that we would really fully enter into that knowledge of God. And do we take the time to make that possible? I, I heard a, an interesting illustration just the other day. You know what a busker is. Sometimes on the streets of the cities and the subways, people will play some kind of a musical instrument and they'll put a hat out and the idea is that people passing by stop and listen and you throw money in the hat and it's, it's kind of a nice way of begging. Well, in Washington, D.C., one of the universities decided to do an experiment. And they hired this fellow to go play a violin in one of the subway stations. And they watched and they kept track of how many people came by and listened and how much money was put in the hat. And he played for about an hour playing some classical music, a Bach, symphony or quartet or, or whatever and, and they counted that over the space of an hour about 3,000 people passed by but only 20 or so stopped to listen and most would only listen for two or three minutes and then they'd quickly carry on and they talked about how sometimes children would stop and they'd want to listen and mom would kind of hurry them on we've got to get going we can't stop and listen and at the end of that hour, only about $30 had been put in this man's hat. Well, in fact, the man playing the violin was a world-famous violinist named Joshua Bell. And the violin he was playing was worth three and a half million dollars. It was an ancient Stradivarius or something. And just the night before, he had given a concert at one of the best concert halls in Boston, and people paid hundreds of dollars for a ticket to listen to him play the same pieces that he'd been playing on the subway. And everybody just passed him by and missed out on the benefit of hearing some tremendously beautiful music. And of course, 
you know, the illustration, are we rushing past God and missing out on taking in all of the beauty of his person and being able to enjoy that? Finally, the gospel. God calls us into a relationship. Christianity is not a list of rules. It's not a series of rituals. It's not just a ticket to heaven. It's not a religious system. It's not man reaching up to God. It begins in the heart of God. And we read at the beginning of John, in John 17 how it is the desire of the Lord that he would have people with him. This, this love relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that began before there ever was a world, that, that never began, it was eternal, it was always there. And yet God has created people with the idea that they would be brought into this relationship with him and enter into this fellowship, this union with the Godhead. That these words of the Lord Jesus in John 17, that the love that the Father had for me, Jesus says, I want that to be experienced by these people that have come to believe in me. And ultimately, Christianity is coming into a relationship with God and entering into this love union between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the love you have loved me with me may be in them, and I would be in them. And so with a message like that, it compels us to go out with the gospel, to, to reach out to people and to extend the invitation of God to them. Paul says in Corinthians that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are his messengers to invite others into this relationship that we too have come to know. So, be careful in the way you use the names of the Godhead and understand the distinctions between the persons. Take time to enter into the fullness of what God has for us. And be bold to invite others into this union of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you and we praise you this morning for who you are. And I feel that we've just just barely even scratched the surface of the wonders of the Godhead. We thank you, Father, for your care for us, that you are our loving Heavenly Father. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on Calvary's cross for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within us and makes your presence a reality in our lives and empowers us and equips us and works through us. And, and we marvel at, at the wonder of all of this and what you've done for us. And we just want to give you thanks this morning. And we pray, Father, that each one of us might come to know you in a fuller and a greater way. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. We will have a, a break for a few minutes, as is our custom, and then Tim will come back up.